the decks of the ships to, to, to keep fit. The ship's captains would prioritise hiring a, a surgeon for the crossing, a ship's surgeon, and the second most important crew member was a fiddler to keep the spirits up of the emigrants and also to give them a bit of exercise and they would do their sit dancing on the decks, a bit of aerobic exercise. Um, when that dance style met with this more syncopated rhythm and the dance styles of the Cherokee, more of a shuffling dance style, you can kind of think about dances that were done in hardwood floors versus dances that were done on the, on the dirt that allowed a bit more sort of shuffling. Then we came up with a whole other tradition of Appalachian um, dance uh, styles that was gleaned from the Cherokee. So lots and lots of wonderful fusions, which is what we love so much about this. And you know you can hear it in the song. That's the, the gypsy, that's Gypsy Laddie. That song, it's a Scots song. That it's also very popular in Ireland, and it's and it's embedded there. But we don't have maple swamps, so they started to do things to their own. So they started to, the songs, the words of the songs, and the locations of the songs didn't weren't necessarily as relevant anymore. On our CD on the book, there is a song that Sheila K. Adams sings, um, which uh, Young Hunting, which is a very well known old Scots ballad. It's very very changed very very little in, in the Southern Appalachians and. Uh, many songs did remain unchanged, but many were changed to suit the environment, to suit the place names and things that made more sense to them. So they weren't going to sing about places that they, they couldn't even remember anymore. They would change them to, to suit themselves. And same with the fiddle tunes. So a, a tune like Lord MacDonald's Reel, which um, was very popular over here and went over with the Scots-Irish, um, they started to not want to call it Lord MacDonald's Reel. I mean, Lord MacDonald might have been the reason they had to leave in the first place, you know, so they... They started to not connect with that sense of patronage, so Lord MacDonald's reel would be renamed to something that was more practical, more suited to their lifestyle, and it was called Leather Breeches. <laughs> so there's lots of these wonderful things to discover. Um, one of the things that we enjoyed most about this process, we really wanted to tell a story that goes deep back into history, but we didn't want people to think that there was an end point to this story. It didn't begin at a certain point, and it certainly didn't end at a certain point. And although there, um, in the age of mass media, it is more difficult to get a sense of exactly where traditions might have been and might have stayed, because people can access music from anywhere and learn any style at any different, different time, as is um, evidenced by the fact that during this process, Eliza taught me to play claw hammer banjo, not my native instrument, although it may be now. But in any event, um, we wanted to talk to people who really, who, who were of an age that sort of predated that sense of mass media and who could tell us about their own family lineage from, uh, from within this music tradition. So we talked with people in the States, uh, Pete Seeger, Jean Ritchie, Doc Watson, um, over here Jean Redpath, Archie Fisher, um, John Purser, people who could, who could really shed light on this and give us this sense of a living tradition that's ongoing. And you know it's ongoing, I spoke about Ed Sheeran recording Wake Any Stranger, but when, when Bob Dylan started to write songs based very much on old Scots ballads, and those then came back over in the era of the recording industry and radio, suddenly it all started to come full circle. We're going to um, wind things up in just a little minute, but I, I want to actually talk a little bit more about the voices of tradition because it's a, it's a very um, dear part of our book, and I think, it's, I think the voices speak and bring the book to life, and then we'll, we'll have another song from Eliza. Thanks. We interviewed 43 individuals in the course of the book. As I mentioned, uh, Margaret Bennett was one of those. Uh, because we wanted their voices to help tell this story. Some of those voices are silent now. Uh, Pete Seeger, we interviewed at his home up above the Hudson River a few years before he died. He, uh, it was as if he was giving his first interview. Uh, I guess he probably interviewed a thousand, two thousand times. But that had that kind of life and engagement to him. Uh, up until the end. Um, I might add, uh, uh, Fiona, that uh, when you think about interviewing that many individuals, you need a lot of help in transcribing. And Eliza was one of our great assistants in terms of uh, transcribing. And I've also got to say this. I can't help but sing along with her because I have a special pride in Eliza. I was an administrator with Warren Wilson College for 15 years, and she is one of our graduates. And every thing she knows, she learned it. <laughs> Uh, but uh, part of the great fulfillment of this book was being having a chance to talk to Doc Watson a couple of times, who, uh, whose ancestor came from Scotland in 1745, made, made his way to the Southern Appalachians and found 
Deep Gap, North Carolina. You can't make up things like that. Doc Watson of Deep Gap uh, recollected that continuity of the music. Uh, I mentioned Pete Seeger, Gene Ritchie, uh, Fiona read from uh, uh, the next excerpt there. Thank goodness Fiona interviewed Gene Redpath. Uh, what a loss to us. But in many ways, we hope that our little bit is doing something to keep those voices alive and with us because they are certainly precious to us. And many continue on with the tradition. Kathy Matea, Grammy Award winner. Uh, uh, David Holt, uh, who's the partner for Doc Watson, and continues Doc's tradition as well. So scattered through the book are these voices of tradition. Uh, you hear some of the voices, of course, on the CD in the back of the book. And, uh, Fiona might uh, add a couple more things about that. Uh, the opening track is Dolly Parton, and naturally everybody wants me to introduce them to Dolly. And I uh, haven't met her yet, actually. Um, but she's of uh, Scotch, Scotch Irish, and English ancestry, and wrote the forward to the book and sings the beautiful ballad Barbary Allen uh, as the first track, which reminds us that this was an oral tradition, the music coming over through these voices of tradition over the generations. And verses uh, would change. Barbara Allen, for example, has three tune families to it, not to mention 197 variants uh, found by the song collectors, such as Cecil Sharp, who came from England in 1916 and spent the, the three successive summers with Maud Capellas collecting the old ballads, the old songs uh, that went back uh, over the ages. Other song collectors, like Bascom Lamar Lunsford, uh, of uh, nearby Asheville collected over 3,000 of them, fiddle tunes and songs. Bascom was a, 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 he was a lawyer, he was a legislator, but he loved to sell fruit trees. And the reason for that is he would go into the back roads, uh, have a negotiation to sell some trees, but then he would say, you got a song you could sell, you could share with him. He engendered the trust of the individual. So many others along the way, Dame Olive, uh, Olive Dame Campbell, Jane Hicks Gentry, many of the finest, uh, Song collectors were women, and we owe them a great debt as well. So uh, the story continues, as we said, uh, and what we're finding uh, is that uh, it's striking the chord with younger generations. Many of you know that many years ago, with the only self and my wife, Darcy, we started the Swanigan Gathering at Warren Wilson College. Uh, traditional song weeks, uh, Appalachian, Celtic, Margaret Bennett was taught in that for many years. This past summer, we had 1,500 people from all over the world, including 